uh, it, it is a plain fact that uh, uh, there have been, in my area of expertise, which is Jack Kennedy's medical evidence, uh, five groups fundamentally that have looked at the medical evidence, autopsy evidence, some of them have seen the autopsy photographs and x-rays, and have concluded uh, overwhelmingly, not, uh, not uh, completely, but overwhelmingly that uh, the wounds are consistent with Oswald having been the assassin, shots from above and behind, uh, and multiple groups of really quite uh, accomplished specialists have, have agreed with this. Uh, we had some of them in the audience today, you know, in the last few days, uh, Michael Bodden, former coroner of New York City, uh, being perhaps the most uh, vocal proponent for uh, the single assassin theory. Uh, what I discovered and I have on the web now at a website called historymatters.com is a very lengthy essay which I summarized in my remarks uh, yesterday. A and the fact is that from the outset of the assassination, uh, the conclusions were drawn by J. Edgar Hoover on the night of the assassination that Oswald had done it alone. He, there are memos to that effect. Um, uh, he then sent his agents uh, to confirm his con conclusion reached before the investigation. They, of course, reported back, yes, boss, you were right. Uh, we then, because this is under the auspices of the Justice Department, uh, the autopsy report is done, and the autopsy report starts coming into some question in the middle 60s. Um, thereupon, the Justice Department very quietly starts uh, organizing a a, what they said was an attempt to spike calls for a wide-ranging investigation of the whole case by focusing on the autopsy evidence. And they do that by getting the original autopsy surgeons, who by all accounts did a lousy job of the autopsy, and having them look at the materials and saying, did you do a good job? And of course, they reported back, we did a wonderful job. So they you know, looked at their old navel. They said, it looks wonderful in here. And, um, and, and that was supposed to satisfy skeptics. It didn't work. So then the Justice Department was forced to seek independent counsels. But it, again, organized all this. And from declassified memos that came out only in the 1990s, we found what they were telling their uh, experts. Now, these, they were men with impeccable credentials. I mean, I'm not going to say they weren't uh, chairmen of departments in, in various places. But they, the memos show, and from their own writings, they show that uh, Ramsey Clark, the attorney general, told them, listen, your job is to come in here and debunk some of this stuff that Warren critics are saying. And so I, it is evident from the quality of their work, uh, which is very shoddy for men of, of estimable credentials, that they didn't take the project very seriously. They made silly errors, uh, both in reading the x-rays and saying where the, the wounds were on photographs and x-rays. And every interpretation or misinterpretation, as we now know on the basis of, of not just my evaluation of this, but the evaluation of subsequent examiners, that the early examiners made whopping errors. And, and these are on the basis of the conclusions of uh, ultimate, ultimately uh, uh, very credentialed experts in other groups. Uh, but consistently, all their errors tended to be in an error in one direction, and that is Oswald did it. In 1975, uh, after there had been some revelations of CIA abuses. Uh, Gerald Ford, who was a former Warren Commission member, uh, impaneled uh, the so-called Rockefeller Commission because he made his uh, vice president, Nelson Rockefeller, uh, the chairman of this commission, to look into CIA abuses. And part of that was the allegation that had been made the CIA had been involved in the assassination of Jack Kennedy. And uh, so they looked at the autopsy evidence to see if there were evidence of shots from the right front, uh, because perhaps a couple of CIA agents might have been shooting from there, as, uh, as had been alleged. And so who do they pick to investigate the autopsy evidence or investigate uh, to be the, the, the uh, executive director of the Rockefeller Commission, but a former Warren Commission counsel and, and a real pit bull for the Warren Commission, David Bellin. Uh, so here you have a Warren Commissioner who is the President of the United States nominating as his executive director of an investiga investigation uh, for a Warren Commission counsel to look into the Warren Commission's conclusions. And so it, not terribly surprising that you would get that. And of course then they selected the, the specialists. Um, and right away in the, in the 70s, uh, Dr. Cyril Wecht pointed out in uh, a press release that got some coverage that all the people that they were picking were people who had been previously associated with uh, the, either the government or the institutions that had provided the original uh, people to do the autopsy work, and sure enough, they were. Um, uh, and again, what we found, uh, again, uh, not my conclusions, but the conclusions of other experts who have looked at this subsequent to that for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, uh, their work was extraordinarily sloppy and consistently sloppy along the lines of always making errors that 
pointed the finger of guilt back at Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, you know, as simple matters, uh, perhaps a little detailed, but uh, they said that the trail of fragments in the x-ray, for example, pointed to where they assumed the inshoot was. Well, it turns out they don't point there at all. Uh, but that was supportive of the idea that Oswald had done it, and, um, uh, and so they, uh, they went along with that idea. Uh, and, and they made other surprisingly misinterpretations of the data. They say that there's no movement of the limousine occupants before Kennedy gets, in his head, gets hit in the head with a bullet uh, at the famous Zabruder frame 313. Well, there's a lot of movement of uh, the limousine occupants at around 236, 237. The governor sitting right in front of Jack Kennedy is hit and moves visibly, jerks around in reaction to his shots, and is pulled down to the seat before Kennedy takes the headshot. How could somebody, particularly a government investigator, have looked carefully at the film and have reported that? It wasn't publicly available then. No one was able to check his facts there. And I think he assumed that, uh, that nobody would check their facts. And so these sorts of facts, they misread the x-rays, they misread the autopsy photographs, they misread the, misread the physical evidence. And with each mistake, the mistakes just so happened uh, to coincide with supporting Oswald's guilt. So, we then, in terms of exploring this, came forward to the investigations of the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And, and again, this is an uh, extraordinarily brief summary of what to, is written on the, on the web right now at a, over 100 pages. Uh, and the House Select Committee on Assassinations uh, uh, came up and, again, made appalling errors, uh, did not interview important witnesses, although they got a lot of the things right that had gotten, been gotten wrong in previous investigations. Uh, perhaps their biggest failing um, uh, is that as an organization, the House Select Committee on Assassinations had a real serious problem. Uh, Kennedy was shot in Dealey Plaza, taken to a hospital where a, a team of very experienced trauma specialists examined him and said he had a hole in the back of his head. Uh, well, the autopsy photographs don't show a hole in the back of the head. They show an intact back of the head, virtually not a hair out of place, a little red spot which they said was a wound of entrance toward the top of the skull. Well, what was the you know, uh, House Select Committee going to do with this very distinct contrast. And so uh, it reported uh, in one of its volumes that uh, they had resolved the problem. And uh, they had done that because they'd gone off to interview the witnesses who had been at the morgue. Now, certainly people who were involved in a resuscitation, people who are emergently trying to keep Jack Kennedy alive, may not be as good witnesses as people who are standing around a morgue for four hours. And so they said, well, we have shown uh, this, uh, you know, that the Parkland doctors were wrong because we interviewed the 26 witnesses who were present in the morgue and all of them have endorsed the photographs that show no defect in the back of the head. Therefore, the doc do Dallas doctors are wrong. But when they published their report in 1978, they didn't release the interviews that they'd taken with these people from the morgue who were witnesses to the autopsy. They didn't release diagrams they prepared. After the JFK film came out and an outrage was uh, elicited from the public that all these documents were still being held in secret, out come those, out tumble those documents. So we look at what these people said in the morgue, and all the people in the morgue said the same thing the Dallas doctors said. And they drew diagrams, uh, they uh, gave very explicit testimony, the right rear quadrant of the head is missing, for example, is, is one of the quotes. And we're not just talking about technicians, although the technicians said that as well, we're talking about uh, generals in the morgue and, uh, and other people, high-ranking physicians uh, that were there. Oh yeah, the right rear quadrant of the head. The mortician that prepared the head for burial said, oh yeah, there's a hole square in the back of the head. So now there was a real conflict between the autopsy photographs uh, and what not only uh, the Park Dallas doctors had said, but also what the witnesses in the morgue had said about Kennedy. Uh, uh, it was a big black eye when I first revealed this to the House Select Committee members because everyone denied having written that false passage. Uh, but it, it, it just again so happened that this mistake helps support the case against Oswald. Again, the mistakes always seem to go in one direction. They don't seem to ever fall in the direction of, of getting Oswald off the hook. So then the question arose about the autopsy photographs. But again, and this is another huge finding for us, uh, the House Select Committee reported that it had authenticated the autopsy photographs. And the authentication consisted of looking for internal consistencies. But it reported quite falsely 
that it had not been able to get the autopsy camera that had been used to take the autopsy pictures. And so it wasn't able to completely close the loop on the fact that they were, you know, authentic. But they noticed internal consistencies which supported the, 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 the theory that they were uh, authentic. Well, that was very good until the declassified documents tumbled out. And it turns out that, in fact, they had gotten the autopsy camera. And they tested against the autopsy pictures, and they didn't match. And, in fact, it raised a bit of a stink between the House Select Committee on Assassinations uh, and, and, the, and the, the Department of Defense. Because there is a letter that was reproduced, sent by the House Select Committee back to the Department of Defense under the autopsy was done at the Naval Hospital, the Department of Defense Hospital. And in a kind of a snippy letter, uh, they wrote back saying, we'd like you to get, find the real camera because the camera we have here does not match the autopsy pictures. We've done tests, they don't match. And so um, uh, a fellow named Hester, who was an assistant secretary of defense, wrote back saying, uh, that is the only camera of its kind that was ever used at the, at, at, at the hospital. You have it. Well, the fact that there was this mismatch was withheld from the record. I mean, it, it did not protect in any way national security. It wasn't an important secret, but it undermined the case that they were deciding they were going to make to, to kind of keep Oswald in the box as an assassin. Uh, and it also, t uh, you know, tended to support the idea that the autopsy photographs were accurate representations uh, because not only had they been endorsed by the autopsy witnesses who in fact had refuted them, they'd been validated, which they never had been. So what can we say about the autopsy photographs? Well, several things. One is, all of the people who were involved in taking the autopsy photographs say that the photographs they took are missing. And they didn't just say that afterward. They said that even in Warren Commission testimony, they described saying, oh, we took a photograph of this, we took a photograph of that. When finally the photographs are seen publicly, and I've seen the originals in, in, at the National Archives, those images are not in the collection. Um, uh, they then later testified when they were brought at other times to view the uh, photographs. Look, we took a picture of the interior of the body. There is no photograph of the interior of the body. We took pictures of the skull wound. There are no pictures of the skull wound they said they took. There are people who develop pictures of the, uh, uh, for the government after the autopsy who said, we saw pictures that later vanished. So there are serious questions about Jack Kennedy's autopsy record, uh, not only because consistently has the government selected experts who would help support its case and embarrassingly did so, people with wonderful credentials uh, who either by inattention or sloppiness made the sorts of errors that always ended up at errors that supported the government's position about Oswald uh, or later frankly falsified the record. Uh, the biggest embarrassment was the fact that they left perhaps the most important medical witness uh, un uninterviewed, you know, uh, unasked. They left him completely out of the loop. Who was that? It was a fellow named Dr. George Berkeley. He was the president's personal physician. He was in the motorcade when Kennedy was shot. He was with the president when he was taken to Parkland Hospital and they tried to save his life. He flew with the body on an airplane back to the morgue. He was in the morgue and traveled up and down between the morgue and the, and the, and the 17th floor of the hospital to, to visit with a family, but was there the whole time. He was never brought in for an interview by the Warren Commission, by the Rockefeller Commission, by the Clark Panel, uh, by the uh, House Select Committee on Assassinations. And he was privately telling people and publicly telling people that he thought there was a conspiracy. So here's somebody who is probably, you know, who, uh, the, best, the best witness, medical witness to all the events, you know, with the broadest reach and the most familiarity with Jack Kennedy as a person, he's not even brought in to be interviewed. Uh, uh, it's an appalling lapse, to say the least. Well, neutron activation analysis is actually a technique. Um, you take material, it doesn't have to be bullet lead, but it was bullet lead in the Kennedy case, and you irradiate it. And based on the reaction that you get after that, you can come to an idea as to chemical elements in that material. Um, it was used in this case because people had a false idea on how probative it was. And they wanted, they thought it was the chemical profile of a bullet or a bullet fragment was like a fingerprint. And so if your major issue, the evidentiary dividing line, what I call it, between conspiracy and non-conspiracy, is whether or not there were two or three bullets involved in the wounding of the men in the limo, well, if you can match the fragments point blank to another bullet and count them that way, you'd have your answer. That was the promise of the NAA. See, NAA is just a technique in what is called comparative bullet lead analysis. And what started to be 
discussed in the literature and what has eventually led the National of Academy of Sciences to essentially, in a month, they're going to be saying that this science is unreliable. What they started to realize is that more than one bullet produced by a manufacturer can have the same chemical profile as another bullet. It's more like your blood type. Lots of people have your blood type. It's not like DNA. Only you have your DNA. So if your issue is trying to distinguish two from three, if I gave you a pool of blood and you found A positive and B negative, you wouldn't say, I have two and only two types of blood here, you, or, or number of people who shed blood. You would say, well, I have at least two because somebody else could have shed two people could have A positive blood. And the point I was trying to make in my presentation is that the way modern forensic chemists deal with the same problem is if they recovered fragments from a crime scene and got the chemical profile, they would couch their conclusions as there are at least two fragments or at least two bullets here. And there's one thing I can get every single person, pro-conspiracy conspiracy and anti-conspiracy, to agree on, that there were at least two bullets fired. Nobody thinks there were one, so it doesn't really help you out much. Key point, I think the men were hit with at least three bullets. You can never say anything's impossible, but you can evaluate things as to whether or not they're likely or unlikely. And if anybody ever came to me, if anybody in my family, God forbid, were shot and killed, and they came to me and said, we're closing the investigation, and here's the bullet that broke two major bones, uh, well, one major bone and one minor bone, and um, we're closing the case, we got the guy. And it looked like that, I would spend the rest of my life trying to find out who really killed my relative. You don't think you're getting off yet? We're going to have supper, sir. We're going for a few more hours, sir, right? <laughs> if I could have prevailed upon the uh, good fathers at uh, Duquesne, I would have done it. Well, um, you know, it's always a dangerous road to start upon uh, when one expresses. Uh, gratitude and appreciation but really the first uh, the first vote of appreciation goes to you guys you're the survivors almost six o'clock on a Sunday been 70 degrees outside professional football we've been at it since Thursday a big round of applause for you people who are here now <laughs> it should be like one of those games where the uh, survivors uh, win the, um, the, second, um, the second group uh, is, of course, uh, our group of uh, presenters. Just well, what a, uh, a wonderful array of, of talent. Just think of all the people who have paraded uh, before you. Uh, this uh, has been absolutely fantastic. And I don't say this, uh, I mean, we, we extended the invitations, but there wasn't anything a brilliant um, or amazing strategy on that uh, and uh, except in a few instances maybe you dig around but in almost all situations we knew who the people were so it was just a matter of phone calls and letters their response and their willingness to come here and fit this into their schedule is what uh, made this uh, truly such an outstanding uh, conference it's um, undoubtedly the, uh, the highlight of, of anything that has been done vis-a-vis uh, -vis the JFK assassination in four decades. So I want to express on behalf of all of us, mm, the audience I know, the ones who have come and gone since Thursday, all of you here, and all of us uh, at this end at Duquesne, our, our deepest appreciation and gratitude to uh, all of the faculty uh, who have been with us since uh, Thursday night. And I want to um, then thank Dean Rago, uh, Benjamin Wecht, uh, Maria Comis, Eileen Edwards, and all their volunteers for the uh, excellent work that they have done making life easier and more comfortable, moving it along. You have all been to conventions and conferences, as I have uh, many, many times, and you know how difficult it is, the logistics and so on, and also to keep things moving, and here it is, and we are amazingly on time, and uh, nothing has been uh, left out. Uh, uh, nobody has uh, disappointed us. I can tell you now, by the way, it was touch and go very legitimately with Senator Specter. We've been on pins and needles uh, for three days because it was a 50-50 chance and 
I checked, I checked uh, with my own congressman, it was true. Um, the Senate might be in session on Saturday. And um, uh, I, I knew that it was true uh, because the senator did not have to accept in the first place and he could have bowed out any time he wanted to. Um, and he, uh, he stuck with it and, and we are very grateful uh, uh, to him for doing this. This was a first, as you know, in terms, I think, of the senator being on a program simultaneously with critics. And um, it, it, listen, it's not easy. I've been, I've been on the other side of this talking sometimes. <laughs> I remember once Michael Barton invited me up to Albany with all of the state police who revere and worship him. And I, I remember what it was like for me. So I, I felt compassion and empathy in my heart for what it had to be like for Michael and, and Arlen Specter. And I think both of them uh, handled themselves extremely well. They were right to their views. And I want you to know, too, we invited several other people from the Warren Commission side. Vincent Bugliosi, whom I know quite well, and I pleaded with him, and he wanted to, and originally was going to come, but his publisher uh, forbade him. He's got a book uh, he's been working on it for a long time. And um, Burton Griffin, now Judge Griffin from Ohio, uh, Norman Redlick, uh, I think former, became dean of the NYU Law School, and uh, attorney in Washington, D.C., I think it's Willen, I believe, who was number two under Rankin. So we, we reached out. Unlike some of the TV programs, I haven't watched them at all. I'm not much of a TV viewer to begin with, and obviously this week I've had no time. But unlike ABC and I, I think others, uh, a two-hour presentation ABC, not one single Warren Commission critic researcher, not one. I think that is professionally irresponsible. It is personally despicable. It is absolutely the most unethical thing that I can think of. Look at the, at the, Fox, at the Fox program. And they came down on, on our side, on the critic side. They had um, Son of Spectre. They had um, uh, Michael Bodden. They had uh, I think one, somebody else, uh, I forget. Uh, uh, and so on. They even had a police officer right here in Pittsburgh where we set them up for the who said yeah I could get that shot off or so on. they they did it and they presented uh, some other views and they let they let their thought come through nothing wrong with that we're not going to win everybody over and we all know here those of us who are in the critic researcher community that we're certainly not going to win over uh, regrettably the news media establishment hey, look at this conference alone with this lineup of MDs and PhDs and uh, JDs and professors and a US senator and a federal judge and uh, the people going back then to the um, assassination um, the, the first uh, and then all the way through uh, through the HSCA and the ARRB and so on and Tannenbaum and Cornwell and so on if you had if you could I don't know it, it, I'm not going to try to think of an analogy but let's say well here in Pittsburgh for example we've had a very uh, wonderful organ transplant center with Tom Starzl and so on let's say they had a, a big conference on that and so on do you think if they were uh, they had this kind of a lineup in their field and they had 1,300 people as we did hanging from the rafters in the chandeliers on Friday. Do you think that that Well, initially, of course, I did not know anything more than other Americans. And frankly, uh, when I first heard about it, uh, aside from the personal uh, reaction to this horrible tragedy and my thoughts as a young American who admired uh, Kennedy, as an active uh, Democrat uh, who looked at him as a political leader uh, with much promise uh, yet and all the things to be fulfilled, I really wasn't thinking so much about the forensic scientific aspects, even though I was a fully trained forensic pathologist. I just assumed that it would be, from that standpoint, a straightforward murder case, you know, insofar as how was he shot, where's the entrance wound, where's the exit wound, you know, that's like saying, you've heard that somebody dear and near to you has to undergo an appendectomy or was undergoing that operation right then and there. At, uh, you know, you wouldn't think, you would assume, if it's at a hospital, it's going to be done by a board-certified general surgeon who will know uh, what's happening and so on. It wouldn't occur to you that the person may wind up uh, with uh, um, hepatic and renal failure, um, brain death, uh, infections, and so on. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving this to you as an analogy. What has emerged 
what we are still talking about 40 years later is unfathomable. It, nobody in the world could have predicted this. Now, if I had known, and I don't know when I first came to know, that the two pathologists who are going to be selected to do this autopsy had never done a gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers, then I might have already begun to have some misgivings. When I came to learn that they had missed a bullet hole in the front of the neck and did not know until the next day when the president's body was gone that there was a bullet hole over which a tracheostomy had been superimposed and they were already reconstructing their autopsy findings. Uh, when I came to know that the preliminary autopsy report and notes were burned in the fireplace of Commander Hume's home. You see what I mean? So, you know, what did I know? What did anybody know at the beginning? This should have been a straightforward gunshot wound case. You know, setting aside what it meant politically, personally, from a purely forensic pathology, homicide investigative matter, it should have been pretty straightforward. And with regard to forensic science, there was a board certified forensic pathologist, Dr. Earl Rose, who was the medical examiner. He was there at Parkland Hospital to assume jurisdiction. And if the autopsy had been done by Dr. Rose, I have no doubt that we would not be sitting here today talking about this case. I'm not saying everything would have been necessarily laid out. The movie JFK uh, really begins with Jim Garrison, who is a much maligned figure, uh, even by people in the research community who bought into a lot of the things that were said about him and who may have been frustrated and sometimes in, in actually dealing with him. Jim Garrison was a, uh, it was a bigger than life figure. I knew him very well. I worked with him for uh, two years on his book, On the Trail of the Assassins, which is how the movie uh, began. It really began because despite Jim Garrison being maligned as a southern caricature, gothic uh, kind of guy and an uh, ambitious politician and all these uh, you know, corrupt uh, uh, media, uh, uh, media crazy, uh, mafia, taking uh, uh, bribes from mafia, fondling little boys, uh, everything was said about this man. And uh, unfortunately, at the time, it wasn't clear that uh, this was an orchestrated campaign to smear him. Uh, up until he uttered three little letters, CIA, Garrison was a very popular man, revered in the press, revered in New Orleans, uh, you know, a crime fighter, uh, a model citizen, 23 years in the military, uh, former FBI agent, hardly a flaming radical by any means. But as soon as he uttered those three little letters, everything changed. We now know because a, uh, of a CIA memo that was uh, made public under the Freedom of Information Act, we know that there was an orchestrated campaign to smear uh, the critics of the Warren Commission. At the time, Mark Lane and Jim Garrison were the most prominent of those. And in that uh, memo, the CIA station chiefs are directed to use their media assets to write stories in the press uh, that exposed the critics as financially interested, politically motivated, careless in their research, uh, paranoid and crazy, and so forth. Sound familiar? This, was the, uh, this is exactly the portrait that emerged of Jim Garrison. Jim Garrison was forgotten for a long time. Uh, he wrote this book on his own, uh, and it was ready to go two years before the 25th anniversary of the assassination, which is 1988. But he wrote the book as a his, historical document, as a, as a piece of history. Uh, the publisher who commissioned it rejected the book. They, they said every chapter was great, and then they said, we can't publish this. Garrison was convinced that the CIA had, in, had uh, interfered in that process, and he uh, in turn took his manuscript and went to a small publisher in New York named Sheridan Square Press and I worked as an editor for that press. That press specialized in books about the CIA uh, by former CIA agents mostly and uh, in working on that manuscript we reworked the book so that it became a, a why done it told from the first person uh, Garrison's own uh, uh, experience of his investigation. 
That book was uh, published in 1988, didn't get any reviews in any of the major press. It got one paragraph in the New York Times uh, with a several other books in review uh, because Garrison was essentially dismissed as this kook from the 60s. However, the publishers met Oliver Stone in an elevator at the Havana Film Festival in Cuba, handed him the book, and Oliver Stone read it, decided he wanted to make a movie. He was busy on another movie, uh, Born on the Fourth of July, and he asked the publishers who he could get going on the book. They recommended me, and I started working on the screenplay. Uh, he hired me over the telephone, and uh, I spent the next year doing additional interviews and, of course, working from Garrison's uh, a manuscript plus Garrison's other memories. I interviewed him extensively and, and those of his staff who, were, who remained uh, alive and accessible. Uh, we did over 200 interviews. Uh, uh, one of the main researchers, Bob Spiegelman, is here tonight. Uh, he's someone you may want to talk to about the, uh, about the work that went into this. There were a lot of people doing research. A lot of the work came not just from Garrison and from uh, Stone and from me, but from citizen researchers who had done a lot of work over the years. Uh, Jim Mars's book, Crossfire, uh, was uh, acquired by Oliver because he wanted to make sure that the uh, information that had been learned over the past 25 years that Garrison did not have access to in 1968 and 1969 when the trial was going on could be put, put into the film. He wanted modern day audiences to have the benefit of cumulative knowledge that uh, mainstream journalists had not informed them of, but that citizen researchers had been doing for all those years. So uh, a lot of that uh, information is incorporated in JFK, and in that context, it raises the question, how literally accurate and factual is the film? Uh, we put out a book called the, uh, the the, the book of the film, JFK, the book of the film, that is a, is a source noted uh, screenplay. Uh, uh, and it also has a number of articles after the film was released. Um, but that, those source notes tell you where we got the stuff that's in the film. Uh, it also tells you where uh, there is speculation. It also tells you where there is composited characters. And it also tells you where uh, information that was not known at the time has been put into the film. Um, a good example of that is one of the key scenes in the film, is the scene with Donald Sutherland, Mr. X, uh, which uh, Garrison did not actually meet the person who is that, that stuff is based on, named uh, Fletcher Prouty. He didn't meet him in 1969. He didn't meet him until after uh, his book came out in 1988. Uh, what he did do was he met with another character named Richard Case Nagel in a s similar setup. Uh, a mysterious guy calls and says he's from an agency he can't name. He has information about the assassination. He wants to meet in a park. They met in Central Park in New York, not in Washington. We switched that for obvious reasons to, to have it more, uh, you know, have more significance. Uh, set against the Washington Monument and so uh, Lincoln Memorial, but um, but N uh, Nagel's story was a wild story that Garrison could not check out and did not end up using. However, Fletcher Prouty's story came out when he wrote a letter in 1988 to Garrison saying, "Well, this is what you were doing in New Orleans. Let me tell you what was happening to me." And he, in this letter in 1988, he lays out essentially the story that he tells in the movie as Mr. X. So did Garrison know that stuff in 1969? No. Is it literally true? No. Is it historically and essentially accurate? Absolutely. Uh, the stuff that's in that scene is documented from various sources, but mainly based on the interviews that we did with Fletcher Prouty and his own experience. Uh, but you could say, you could make the argument Jim Garrison did not know that at the time. Similarly, there are composite characters in the film. The character played by Kevin Bacon, uh, who is a, uh, a prisoner uh, who gets into a whole homosexual incident with uh, Clay Shaw and describes a party at which the Cubans and Oswald are there and they're discussing, and David Ferry and Shaw, that they're discussing the assassination. 
Uh, that is a composite of three different, or four different characters, actually, uh, some of which uh, Garrison did not use at his trial, but we had sworn affidavits from them, and we used uh, very, very, uh, we tried to stick almost exactly to the language that these people used in their sworn affidavits. Uh, two of them had been at Clay Shaw's uh, residence. One described uh, having dinner at a long table, just the way he describes in the, fi in the film. Uh, another one of them had been paid for sex by Shaw. Uh, and then the other one was Perry Russo, who actually was a, the main witness for Garrison at the trial. And he described the whole incident with the uh, uh, Cubans and, and uh, David Ferry and Shaw and Oswald at this party. So that's the kind of thing that we did uh, that the critics uh, latched onto and said, well, this film is takes dramatic license. The measure that we used was basically uh, not whether something was literally factually correct, but whether it was honest and true uh, essentially. So that whether or not three of these people had uh, actually, we could have had three different scenes with three different people saying these different things, but by compositing into one, we made it a much more dramatic scene. and it remained, I believe, essentially true. Similarly with the, uh, just as a lesson in screenwriting, the scene with Jack Lemmon in the, uh, at the racetrack uh, is a scene that I wrote based on uh, Garrison's memories of his uh, interviews with Jack Martin, this detective who hung around with uh, Oswald and Bannister in the summer of 63 uh, in New Orleans. That, that scene, I wrote the way Garrison described it to me, which was as an interview between Garrison and Jack Martin in Garrison's office. The same dialogue is used, the same content. It goes in and out of uh, descriptions of what, what was going on that summer. All the same words, but when I got that script back from Oliver Stone, who had rewritten it, that scene was set at the racetrack. Well, was it literally true? No. But essentially true? Absolutely. Not only was it uh, more dramatic because you had a more interesting setting and you had the drama of the hoofs, which highlighted certain uh, uh, dramatic parts of the scene, but it also was truer to Jack Martin's character. It brought out the kind of person that we were actually dealing with. This guy was an alcoholic, uh, gumshoe, and this is exactly the kind of place he would have been at a racetrack watching the morning workouts. So in a sense, it deepened the character. It did, it did what a fictional film can do that a documentary cannot do. Documentary has its virtue, obviously it tells you, you know, what, what, what actually happened, but a, a fictional film has a different uh, way of approaching things, and it can in some ways deepen the truth, uh, not just uh, subvert it. Uh, we were often accused in the media when the film came out of subverting the truth. Newsweek ran a cover story that said, called it the twisted truth of JFK. And I had the privilege of speaking to the researcher for Newsweek before that cover story came out. And she told me that they were going to say that Jim Garrison had never set foot in the courtroom during the Clay Shaw trial. And I pointed out to her that it was true that Garrison had not conducted the uh, the whole trial. Uh, he had left most, most of that to his assistants uh, because he did not want himself to be the focus of attention. Uh, he knew that he was already a media circus figure and he wanted the focus to be on Clay Shaw and on the, on the, on the, case, the facts of the case. So he let his assistants do most of the trial work. However, Garrison did give an opening statement and he did give a closing statement. 80% of the closing statement in the film is taken directly from Jim Garrison's own words in his own closing statement to the actual uh, jury at the trial. And I pointed this out to the Newsweek researcher. I said, don't believe me. Go to the court, get the transcript, look for yourself. Sure enough, the f two days later, the magazine comes out. Jim Garrison never set foot in the courtroom. And this is the Newsweek telling us that we've twisted the facts of JFK, twisted truth of JFK. This happened uh, many times, and, I, and, 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 it, and it, uh, we, we had a lot of criticism 
as Cyril Weck pointed out, from journalists whose careers were made that day in Dallas. Dan Rather, Tom Wicker, Dick Stolle, as Jerry Polgakoff uh, pointed out, they were all, Robert McNeil, they were all young reporters at the time. Uh, they, their careers took off that day, and they took off because they basically adopted the Oswald, the lone nut, uh, did it uh, theory. Uh, what we call this is cognitive dissonance. You know, once you establish a position uh, and you rise up high in the ranks, these people went to the top of their profession, uh, you don't just give it up readily. Uh, and that's what happened. Uh, it's impossible to shake someone like Dan Rather out of his position. Um, and they were rewarded handsomely for, for continuing to, to uh, report uh, uh, as they had. So um, this is the kind of thing that we were up against. Tom Wicker wrote a column uh, condemning the film because it made people question the United States government. I wrote him a long letter saying, well, you know, in my view of this country, uh, the government doesn't deserve to be trusted just automatically. It has to earn the trust of the people. If it doesn't earn the trust of the people, the people have the right to get rid of that government. That's the way I understand democracy. But he was insulted that uh, somehow we'd made people doubt the credibility of the United States government. He never answered the letter. Um, the uh, film got a lot of attention. It stirred up a lot of controversy. My own theory about it is that it wasn't so much that it's a great mystery story, which obviously it is, and that's why we're all interested in it. But also, I feel that what it did was it opened up uh, a raw wound that had been in the American psyche for a long time and that didn't deal just with the assassination. I think there was a cumulative rage building in the population. And this movie was released in 1991 when George Bush was president, the first. And um, we'd seen an accumulation of, beginning with the assassination, of outrages and lies from the government, beginning with the Vietnam War, where they coined the term credibility gap, going through Watergate, the cover-ups, the lies from Nixon, uh, going through the Iran-Contra affair uh, and the cover-up there. And I think what had happened was that there was a cumulative rage. And in fact, I myself was quite jaded about the whole thing, where it got to the point where I just uh, uh, said to myself, you know, uh, the government lies, that's just the way it is, and we're never going to be able to do anything about it. The one great thing about Jim Garrison was that he was totally outraged, even 25 years after the fact, and his rage, he couldn't understand why people weren't out in the streets, uh, you know, demonstrating and uh, at the outrage that their government had been stolen from them. That rage really, uh, uh, it meant something to me, and it touched me, and it, it made me actually work on, on, on the book originally. And I think what happened with the movie is that it touched a raw nerve with people that was far beyond the assassination. I think it spoke to a lot of people about an ongoing secret government that we have to do something about, that we have to get control of. And I think that's why people flooded Congress with letters asking that those closed files be opened up. And that's why we got the law uh, uh, creating the uh, Assassination Records Review Board, and that's why we got two million pages of documents. Now, I'm not a great believer that there are uh, not uh, a lot of documents that still exist. I'm also, I also believe that a lot of documents, we've seen how uh, Oliver North dealt with documents. They shredded the important ones. I'm sure that's happened also. However, that much said, we still have to uh, push for, for more open, openness and, and to get all the information we can. And as I said earlier, I, I'm a great believer in absolutely dismantling the CIA uh, because I think those kind of secret organizations are, are just a, a counter to anything that I consider to be a democratic institution. And um, anyway, the film came out, uh, we got the, that uh, law passed, and uh, here we are. Uh, Ten years later, a lot of stuff has happened, and, I, and over the next few days, uh, people will be talking about a lot of the information that came out as a result. I was in charge of the investigation of the assassination for the U.S. House of Representatives from 77 to 79. The Select Committee's, um, well, it, it's a committee of Congress, so nominally its objective is to investigate for the purpose of determining whether or not 
additional legislation should be passed. But in reality, the purpose of the investigation was to reinvestigate the case from all angles. And the reason for that was that there was a um, large part of the American public that did not believe the findings of the Warren Commission, didn't think that they could be trusted in their findings, and so they wanted another investigation. And that's the one that we did. So all aspects of it were reinvestigated. Whether Oswald was involved, if so, to what extent? Was there a conspiracy? If so, who might be the conspirators, et cetera? We, we obviously had uh, an obstacle, which was that 15-year span. Um, and you know, memories tend to fade, witnesses die, et cetera. So while we had investigators who interviewed people in a normal way, uh, much of what you could have done had you been given the assignment to investigate it in 63 and 64 was no longer possible. So we devoted most of our resources to two things, science, and we not only redid all of the sciences, ballistics, handwriting, et cetera, that were done by the Warren Commission, there were new sciences available to us that were not available to the Warren Commission, the most significant of which was the um, acoustics analysis we did, which led to the conclusion that there were four shots fired and two shooters. Uh, in addition to that, the government's files were full of relevant information that the Warren Commission had never looked at. Uh, in the mafia field, as an example, there were illegal uh, wiretaps on all the major mafia figures throughout the United States, with the exception of Santos Travacani and Carlos Marcello. The Warren Commission, you, I mean, if you're going to investigate the case, you've got to look at the possibility of the mafia. And the Warren Commission had never bothered to look at any of those transcripts. In fact, the Warren Commission never had a single lead run out for it by the organized crime section of the FBI or the organized crime section of the Ju uh, Justice Department. Uh, and it, just to, again, to illustrate, um, if you're going to investigate, you need to look at the possibility of anti-Castro Cubans. Um, the CIA's files were full of that um, because they were either financing or if not financing, monitoring, depending on the group, um, all the major anti-Castro groups that were strewn along our Gulf Coast during the early 1960s. We negotiated um, the first ever, I think, congressional access to CIA files on the basis of uh, sources of methods left in, no redacting. Uh, so we, for the first time, looked at all that stuff. The Warren Commission uh, guys actually testified in our hearings that had they, that they thought that if the CIA had had anything, they would have given it to them. And the CIA testified that they thought if the Warren Commission had wanted something, they would have asked for it. So there was no exchange of that kind of information during the original investigation. So those are just examples. So One of the things that I talked a lot about here at the seminar is what I think, what I think was the strongest and the most significant finding of the, of the Select Committee on Assassinations, the most significant finding, and that is that the Warren Commission never conducted a conspiracy investigation and then lied to us about the result. To a lesser degree of certainty, but to a high degree of probability, um, I concluded, I mean, I believe that the, that the evidence uh, reflects that there were two shooters, and that means there was a conspiracy. Dropping down from that, at lower levels of certainty, there are, we, we came up with worlds of new information as to who might have been involved in that conspiracy, but could not resolve that to any great degree of certainty. There was a lot of new evidence suggesting the possibility of the mafia. There was a lot of new evidence suggesting the possibility of anti-Castro Cubans. And in fact, not only my committee, but the uh, Senate committee who looked into um, the uh, Cuban assassination plots right before our committee started, um, both we and they concluded that the presence of the CIA mafia plots, who they, were, they were conspiring together to kill Castro, um, suggested the possibility that Castro found out about those plots and may have either turned someone around and sent him back or retaliated through someone else uh, against the president. Um, one of the things that we did discover 
by going down and talking to Castro was that he did know he had learned of those plots. But um, he said, you know, it would have been crazy for him to have you know, retaliated against the President of the United States, and in fact, he didn't. That was his testimony. I wrote a book that's called, after 20 years, 20 years later, it's called Real Answers. And the, I sort of defined it in there, is being um, the answer based on the weight of the credible evidence, very similar to a court standard. And based upon that, and again, I'm just talking about what we came up with, I thought Oswald was involved. I thought Oswald was probably a shooter. Uh, so I think that the Warren Commission was probably right about that. Uh, on the other hand, um, even their handling of that investigation has raised lots of issues over the years. But, you know, trials of O.J. Simpson or whoever else you want to talk about raise a lot of issues. And, um, but at any rate, to answer your question, I thought he was probably, on the, bait of the, on, on the way to the credible evidence, uh, involved as a shooter. The Warren Commission's investigation was really as, as ludicrous, in one sense, as, um, you know, as if, uh, you know, Elliot Ness were to have caught uh, a truck full of uh, bootleg uh, whiskey coming across the Canadian border and uh, become immediately satisfied that uh, he had arrested or killed the truck driver and that that was the end of the investigation. They were trying to get a quick answer. They made up their minds before they ever started what answer they wanted. They set the machinery of, govern go of the government in gear to convince us of that predetermined outcome. They never investigated. And that's not, that I can tell you to an absolute certainty. Uh, or as close as, as, any abs as anything can be an absolute certainty. There is no, in my view, no credible counter to that position. Uh, and the reason there's no, you know, there's no credible other side to that, I mean, it, it is a long story, but the, the, the short, short version of it is that um, the memos that they wrote setting up the Warren Commission made it clear that's what they were going to do. Not investigate, but convince us. They picked a blue ribbon panel not to investigate, but to convince us through their prestige that that was the answer. These are all in memos that were written before they ever started. J. Edgar Hoover had decided the issue, put the report on the president's desk before they started to investigate. And there was no way that J. Edgar Hoover was going to let the FBI come up with a conclusion to impeach his finding that he made before they started. And of course, if you look to the FBI's volumes, you will see that basically whenever there was a conspiracy allegation, FBI found a way, found a way to drop it like a hot potato.